They say that money doesn't grow on trees, but the truth is that the modern banking system creates currency far faster than trees can grow. Most people don't have a clue how currency is created. Economists and bankers make it sound so complex that people think they can't understand it. But I'm going to strip our monetary system down to its essence so that you can see the scam behind the curtain and just how it affects you. Every modern society creates currency in pretty much the same way. But since the U.S. dollar is the majority of the world's currency, I'm going to use the United States as our example. It all starts when some politician says, vote for me and I'll make sure the government provides you more free stuff than my opponent will. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. So to provide that supposedly free stuff, the politicians vote for the country to spend more than its income. This is called deficit spending. To pay for that deficit spending, the Treasury borrows currency by issuing a bond. So what's a bond? If you think about it, a bond is really nothing but a glorified IOU. It's a pretty piece of paper with numbers printed on it that says, loan me a trillion dollars today and I promise over a 10 year period I'm going to pay you back that trillion dollars plus interest. But what you need to understand is that treasury bonds are our national debt. These glorified IOUs are to be paid back by you and I and our descendants through future taxation. Therefore, when the government issues a bond, it steals prosperity out of the future so that it can spend it today. The Treasury then holds a bond auction, and the world's largest banks show up and compete to buy part of our national debt and make a profit on it by earning interest. You'll notice that as we move through this process, the big banks are there, taking a cut every step of the way. This isn't by chance, as you'll see shortly. Then, through a shell game called open market operations, the banks get to sell some of those bonds to the Federal Reserve at a profit. To pay for the bonds, the Federal Reserve opens up its big old checkbook and writes bad, bogus, counterfeit checks that should bounce because they're drawn on an account that always has a zero balance, there isn't one penny in there. To quote from the Boston Federal Reserve, when you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover that check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. The Fed then hands those checks to the banks and at this point currency springs into existence. The banks then take that currency and buy more bonds at the next treasury auction. But what is a check? A check is also an IOU. When you write a check, you're making a note that says, here is my IOU for cash. All you have to do is go to the bank and pick it up. Now it's very, very important that you understand this process because we're going to come back later and show you the devastating effect this has on you. The Treasury issues IOUs, bonds. The banks then buy those IOUs with currency. The Federal Reserve then writes IOUs, checks, and hands them to the banks in exchange for the Treasury's IOUs, the bonds. And currency is created. So what's really happening is the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are just swapping IOUs using the banks as middlemen, and abracadabra, presto, currency magically springs into existence. This process repeats and repeats over and over again, enriching the banks and indebting the public by raising the national debt. The end result is that there's a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury. This process is also where all paper currency comes from. The Federal Reserve and the government mistakenly call it base money because they didn't watch episode one of this series and they don't know the difference between money and currency. But I will correctly refer to it as base currency because it is not money. It is currency and as we've learned, there is a big difference. Money has to be a store of value and maintain its purchasing power over long periods of time. We learned in episode one that earlier in our history, our paper currency was just a claim check. It was a representation for real money of intrinsic value the gold and silver that was held on deposit at the treasury. You could walk into any bank and slap your currency, like say a $20 bill, on the counter and redeem it for real money, a $20 gold piece. But now, this base currency that's piling up back here is really nothing but a receipt or a claim check on an IOU, that bond. So it's really nothing but a supply of numbers. The treasury then deposits the newly created currency into the various branches of the government and the politicians say, hey, thanks for that. And the government does some deficit spending on public works, social programs, and war. The government employees, contractors, and soldiers then deposit their pay in the banks. 
Now this may come as a shock to you, but when you deposit your currency with the bank, you're not actually depositing it into an account to be safely held in trust for you. Instead, you're actually loaning the bank your currency, and within certain legal limits, they can do with it pretty much anything they please. This includes gambling in the stock market and loaning it out, at a profit, of course. Now this is where the machine of currency creation really gets cranking, because this is where something called fractional reserve lending comes into play. Fractional reserve lending is exactly what it says. The banks are allowed to reserve only a fraction of your deposit and loan the rest out. Although reserve ratios may vary, I'm going to use a 10% reserve ratio as our example. If you deposit $100 in your account, the bank can legally take $90 of it and loan it out without telling you. The bank must hold $10 of your deposit in reserve just in case you want some of it. These reserves are called vault cash. But why does your bank account still say you have $100 if the bank has stolen $90 of it? Because the bank left IOUs it created, called bank credit, in its place. Now I know this sounds crazy, but here it is in black and white from the Fed. Commercial banks create checkbook money when they grant a loan simply by adding new deposit dollars in accounts on their books in exchange for a borrower's IOU. These are nothing but numbers that the banks type into their computers. And even though these bank credit IOU numbers are very different from base currency numbers, because they only exist in computers, they are still currency. So now there is $190 in existence. Now the reason people take out loans from the banks is to buy something. They're going to buy a house or a car or something like that. So the borrower takes the $90 that the bank loaned to him from your account and he pays the seller of the item. But then the seller deposits that currency into his account and his bank loans out 90% of that and leaves bank credit numbers in its place. So now there's $271 in existence. This process repeats and repeats until under a 10% reserve ratio, an initial deposit of just $100 can create up to $1,000 of bank credit, all backed by $100 of vault cash, just 10%. But as I said, reserve ratios vary wildly. On some deposits, it's 10%, on others, it's 3%, and on some forms of deposits, reserve requirements are zero. The result is that the expansion of the currency supply by the banks is far greater than even this example would lead you to believe. So once again, when currency is deposited in the banks, the banks get to lend it out, and then it gets redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent over and over again, creating bank credit all the way. This is where the vast majority of our currency supply comes from. In fact, 92 to 96 percent of all currency in existence is created, not by the government, but here in the banking system. Now, massive amounts of currency spewing into society may at first sound like a fun idea. That is, until you remember one of the most important hidden secrets of money from Episode 1, that the prices of everyday goods and services act as a sponge on an expanding currency supply. The more currency we have, the more prices rise. This is where inflation comes from. The true definition of inflation is an expansion of the currency supply. Rising prices are merely the symptom. So our entire currency supply is nothing but a couple of bucks whipped up in this hocus pocus scam where the Treasury and the Federal Reserve swap glorified IOUs and a bunch of numbers that the banks just type into their computers. That's it, that's our entire currency supply. It's nothing but a supply of numbers. Some of them printed, most of them typed and there is nothing else. But if you thought that was crazy, get ready to enter the twilight zone of modern economics. We work for some of that currency supply. True wealth is your time, but we trade away moments of our lives, hour by hour, day by day, and year by year, for numbers that somebody printed on pieces of paper or just typed into a computer. Now those numbers represent our blood, sweat, tears, labor, ideas, and talent. We are what gives the currency its value. But here comes the really cruel joke. We work hard so that we can save some of that currency, so that we can pay the tax collector in the United States, it's known as the IRS. They then turn it over to the Treasury so that the Treasury can pay the principal plus interest on that bond that the Federal Reserve bought with a check 
drawn on an account that has nothing in it. Now let's do a recap on this section because this is where the system begins to rob you and I on a massive scale. Much of our taxes are not used for schools, roads, and public services, but to pay interest on bonds that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. The Federal Reserve is committing fraud. But here's one of the biggest secrets of them all. Before the establishment of the Federal Reserve, there was no need for personal income tax. The Federal Reserve was created in 1913, and that very same year, the Constitution was amended to allow income tax. Do you really think this was just a coincidence? Ask yourself how much income tax you've paid over your lifetime. Much of it has been silently siphoned away into the hands of those who own the system. Yes, this system has owners. Who they are is an even bigger secret that we'll get to shortly. But first, we need to understand the mumbo jumbo of the so-called debt ceiling. It's all based on a huge paradox. There was interest due on that bond. And there was interest due on every one of those loans that the banks made. That means that there is interest due on every dollar in existence. Let me ask you something. If you borrow the very first dollar into existence, and that's the only dollar that exists on the planet, but you promise to pay it back plus another dollar's worth of interest, where do you get the second dollar to pay the interest? The answer is that you have to borrow that one into existence and promise to pay it back with interest as well. So now there are two dollars in existence, but you owe four and so on and so on. The result is there's never enough currency to pay the debt. There is always more debt in the system than there is currency in existence to pay the debt. Therefore, the whole system is impossible. It is finite. It will come to an end one day. What would happen if the government stopped borrowing to do deficit spending? Are the payments on those treasury bonds going to stop? What would happen if the public stopped borrowing and going deeper into debt? Are your house and car payments going to stop? No, there is a payment due every month on the principal plus the interest on every dollar in existence and those payments do not stop. If we stop borrowing, then no new currency is created to replace the currency that we used to make those payments. Whether you're making a payment on a loan or paying tax to make a payment on a bond, the portion of the payment that goes to pay off the principal extinguishes that portion of the debt. But the debt also extinguishes the currency. Currency and debt are like matter and antimatter. When they meet, they annihilate each other. If we just pay off the principal only on all the loans and bonds that exist, the entire currency supply just vanishes. So if we don't go deeper into debt every year, look what happens. The whole thing goes into a deflationary collapse under the weight of those payments. Politicians and pundits alike talk about balancing the budget, paying down the debt, and living within our means. They don't understand that that is deflationary. It is impossible to do under our current monetary system without collapsing the whole economy. This is why any talk of a debt ceiling is not only ridiculous, it's delusional. The system is designed to require ever-increasing levels of debt just to continue. And that's why politicians will always kick the can down the road and raise this so-called debt ceiling over and over again until the whole system finally collapses under its own weight. In other words, they don't want it to collapse on their watch. The founding fathers of the United States knew the dangers of central banking and fought to free themselves from this very thing. The Revolutionary War started out as a tax revolt. But now we must pay tax just to have a monetary system. Having just suffered through the hyperinflation of the continental dollar, which was printed into oblivion to finance the Revolutionary War, they understood the dangers of fiat currency and debt-based monetary systems. So to protect future generations from institutional theft and out-of-control government, they wrote into the Constitution that only gold and silver can be money for the simple fact that you can't print them. Our current system is not only unconstitutional, but it robs us of the liberty and prosperity our forefathers fought and died for. We are all feeling the effects of ignoring the Constitution right now. By forcing more currency into circulation, 
our purchasing power is diluted. Inflation is a slow and insidious stealth tax that is simply the result of this debt-based monetary system. This system empowers and benefits those who create the currency and receive it first, as they get to spend it into circulation before it has an effect on the economy. They're stealing purchasing power from you and transferring it to the banks and the government every hour of every day because of this false monetary system. And it's not like the people at the top don't know this. To quote the Federal Reserve, the decrease in purchasing power incurred by the holders of money due to inflation imparts gains to the issuers of money. This is a fraud. It is a pyramid scheme. It is a Ponzi scheme. It's a scam and it's a lie. Our entire monetary system is nothing but a form of legalized theft. But here's the biggest con job of them all. The Federal Reserve is not federal. It has stockholders. There is no federal agency that has stockholders. What's a stockholder? A share of stock represents a percentage of ownership in a corporation. So the stockholders are the owners of that corporation. Therefore, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation with owners. And you can see it for yourself if you go to the Federal Reserve's website, and it will say, the stockholders receive an annual dividend of 6%. Now we know that the stock in the Federal Reserve was originally issued to the largest banks in the United States. But because of mergers and acquisitions through the years, you can't actually trace who owns the stock in the Federal Reserve. That's a very closely guarded secret. My guess would be that the owners are those primary dealers, the banks that get to make a profit by selling part of our national debt, those bonds, to the Federal Reserve, who buys them with a check from nothing. Then we pay tax to pay the principal and the interest on those bonds so that the Federal Reserve can pay the banks a 6% dividend. Don't be alarmed if you don't quite comprehend the deception of this system at first glance. Very few people do. It is purposely complex. The economist John Maynard Keynes once wrote, by this means, government may secretly and unobserved confiscate the wealth of the people, and not one man in a million will detect the theft. I believe that presented correctly, anyone can understand this system, regardless of how complex it is. So let's do a recap and break it down even more. The way the system works is that, step one, the government creates glorified IOUs. These bonds increase our national debt and put the public on the hook to pay it back. Step two, IOUs are swapped to create currency. The treasury sells the bonds to the banks. The banks then turn around and sell our national debt at a profit to the Federal Reserve, which they probably own. The Federal Reserve then opens its checkbook that doesn't have a penny in it and buys those IOUs with IOUs that it writes, checks on a checking account that has a zero balance. Then they give those checks to the banks and currency just springs into existence. And then the whole process repeats. This results in a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury, which is really just a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the numbers in the various branches of the government and we get to step three. The government spends the numbers on promises, public works, social programs, and war. Then the government employees, contractors, and soldiers deposit their pay into the banks. And we get to step four, where the banks multiply the numbers by magically inventing more IOUs through fractional reserve lending, where they steal a portion of everyone's deposit and lend it out. That currency gets redeposited, and then a portion is stolen again. And the process repeats over and over, magnifying the currency supply exponentially. Then we work for some of those numbers, which brings us to step five, where our numbers are taxed. We pay tax to the IRS, who then turns our numbers over to the Treasury, so the Treasury can pay the principal plus the interest on bonds that were purchased by the Federal Reserve with a check from nothing. Then we get to step six, the debt ceiling delusion. The system is designed to require ever-increasing levels of debt and will eventually collapse under its own weight because politicians always kick the can down the road. They don't want it to collapse on their watch. And finally, step seven, the secret owners take their cut. The world's largest banks own the Federal Reserve. Those banks make a profit selling our national debt to the Fed. They make a profit when the Fed pays them interest on the reserves held at the Fed, 
and the Fed pays them a 6% dividend on their ownership of the Fed. This system is fundamentally evil. It funnels wealth from the working population to the government and the banking sector. It is the cause of the artificial booms and busts of modern economies, and it causes great disparity of wealth between the rich and the working class. And it is only possible because we no longer use real money, we use currency. But worst of all, it is a form of enslavement. Bond is the root word of bondage. Whenever a government issues a bond, it is a promise to make us pay tax in the future. Nobody asked you if you wanted to pay tax today for the prosperity we all enjoyed in the last century. Nobody is asking our children if they want to work hard in the future to pay for the prosperity we're enjoying now. George Washington once wrote to James Madison, no generation has the right to contract debts greater than can be paid off during the course of its own existence. By stealing prosperity from tomorrow so we can spend it today, we enslave ourselves and future generations. Now this all sounds pretty bad, but there is great hope, for you are the greatest threat to this false monetary system. This system relies on the public being ignorant of its workings. Please share this knowledge with everyone you know, because an informed public that fully understands the system can build a better future for generations to come.